Welcome to another episode of Affirming Methodism, where we explore topics relevant to the Methodist expression of Christian faith and its evolving role in our world. I'm your host, Marianne Romanat, and I'm joined by Brittany Bethel, the Executive Director of Carolina Cross Connection. We get together each month to dream about a vital future for the church that we want to be part of shaping so that the next generation will take the reins and make it even more vital. Today, in honor of Black History Month, we're delving into the vital importance of acknowledging black history and addressing the systemic racism that has plagued our country and our church. For too long, the contributions of black Methodists have been overlooked or marginalized. Did you know that the Methodist Church was one of the first to ordain black ministers, yet segregation persisted within its congregations for decades? According to data from resourceumc.org, In 2021, only 7% of pastors in our denomination are black. One of our values at Light of Christ is building bridges, and that requires intentionality and commitment. We must engage in courageous conversations, listen to marginalized voices, and amplify their stories within our congregations. Additionally, investing in initiatives that address racial justice, such as community outreach programs and advocacy efforts, can help us live out our faith in tangible ways. Here at Light of Christ, our journey towards reconciliation began in 2022 when we delved into Latasha Morrison's book, Be the Bridge. We were honored to have Morrison herself join us for a transformative session, igniting our passion and understanding and growth. Following her visit, we launched a Be the Bridge Grow Group, immersing ourselves in her insightful 10-week curriculum. In our very first meeting, attended by 12 participants, We embarked on a profound exploration from repentance to reconciliation to reproduction. The experience was nothing short of incredible, prompting us to host subsequent sessions with another one on the horizon. Leading these groups were individuals like Nina Johnson, a cherished member of our community, and a Charlotte native whose leadership fueled our progress. This process taught us the importance of holding space for tension, questions, tears, and laughter, a crucial aspect of healing for both our nation and the church. Today, we are thrilled to share insights from several members who completed the GROW group. Through their interviews recorded earlier this month, we'll delve into their experiences. Later, we'll engage in conversation with two remarkable black women from Charlotte, Nina Johnson and Jade Mason, both Be The Bridge alumni, offering invaluable wisdom as we continue our journey towards reconciliation. Let's start with some of the members from our Be The Bridge groups. You'll hear from Adam, Javier, Marcella, Megan, and Joanne. Take a listen. So first of all, why did you sign up for the Be The Bridge Grow Group? Yeah, so I mean, I had been on a journey um, understanding, you know, some of my own prejudices and trying to unpack, you know, what was going on um, with all these events that kept happening, you know, kind of around this time. And after a couple of years of that, um, and, and I think the, the impetus for me was having some closer friendships with people that um, didn't look like me and hearing some of their own personal stories about things that had happened in their life. And when I had the weight of all these things that I had seen, you know, on the Internet and on my phone and then hearing people that I knew and trusted and and valued as a as a friend talking about some of their experiences it just kind of um all hit me and that you know that there was a problem and i needed to do a better job of listening but i also wasn't content to not do anything anymore that i i wanted to be more part of the uh, solution than than just continuing to be either ignorant or part of the problem as a person of color it is important for us to be part of racial racial reconciliation conversations. I did not realize how important this is, but I also note how this is not available for people. After being in this country for almost 19 years, this is the first time we participate in this type of discussions, and we thank Light of Christ for this opportunity. In addition, we want to be part of the solution in the Light of Christ community. 
and be more hands-on and instrumental rather than being on the sidelines complaining. So I have had a predominantly white community around me most of my life, um, and I have had uh, what I would call rose-colored glasses about just the world that I live in. And I, um, for most of my life, thought that most people um, were not racist and racism wasn't really a big part of everyday life and that they were just these pockets and these, like, unique people um, that had that in them. And um, now my close, some of my closest friends and the colleagues in my professional network are people of color or are married to people of color. And... Um, those glasses have been removed. Um, I now know that that is uh, the majority, not the minority, and it's something that I can't uh, be silent to anymore or acquiescent to uh, just because I now I know, right? So when you know better, you do better. And so um, I wanted to be part of Be the Bridge so that I knew where to start. Um, you know, I had this new knowledge, and um, I just didn't know what to do with it or how to be active with that. And so I was hopeful that being part of this group would just give me some tools to to be part of the movement. I was part of a small group in 2022 that read Latasha Morrison's book, Be the Bridge. And I wanted to learn more about racial reconciliation. It wasn't something that I really knew much about at all. So the class itself, what did you learn from that experience? I think what I, if I had a, bi a takeaway from it, it was that the value of listening and the value of, um, I guess you could say, being an ally. Um, someone that, you know, if you go ever go to a different country, um, you'll notice that if you even just try to speak the language, that there's a level of respect that's gained from that. And I kind of feel like it's the same um, when, we're, when we're doing social justice stuff, that if we're listening and active listening and showing support by, you know, showing up for a festival or showing up for an event, um, having convers difficult conversations, willing to admit, you know, some of the prejudices that we have individually, then those are really well accepted and, and they can be the basis of strong friendships. Be the Bridge Grow Group was a great opportunity to learn how racial and gender segregation experiences have impacted other people's life and communities, what has been done and what is still pending to do. We also learned that in order to build or be the bridge, we need to learn more about others that are different from us. So different race, country of origin, native language. Only by listening and knowing more about those who look or seem different than us is that we realize we might not be that different. If I had to choose you know, just the top thing and the thing that was most impactful was just how long and the brick by brick foundation that was built to create uh, where we are today and how ingrained racism is in every aspect of our society because of that longevity and that history. Um, and, and the gravity of that is, it's really heavy for me and it's really hard uh, to comprehend. Um, and, you know, as part of the discussion and, and what that has done is it's made me understand that, you know, equality is not the same as equity. You know, treating people from both communities equally today isn't equal uh, because we didn't start from the same place. And if we want equal outcomes, that's more of a discussion about equity and how do we get both communities to be at the same playing field. And that's a, a much bigger um, conversation and that's something that-, that Well, I, I learned that racial reconciliation is really a process that we go through. It's a journey rather than some place that we arrive at immediately. And for me, being a white person, the process involves things such as being aware of the truth about racism, past and present, and the brokenness and injustice that's resulted, um, lamenting the hurt that it's caused, seeking forgiveness for that hurt, and repenting, how to not let it continue. And then restoration and restorative justice, what does that look like? So for all those things, um, what does it all look like on a personal level? That's a, a big question for me. And they're all these are all biblical concepts with examples all throughout the Bible. What do you still wrestle with today? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think anyone that says that their uh, work is done um, probably isn't introspecting enough. And that was another, I guess that would be another thing I learned from the group is that, um, you know, even people that are being marginalized or oppressed still have biases and, and stereotypes. So to expect that we're not going to have any is um, not realistic. 
Um, and I, I do remember um, sitting with one of my friends uh, uh, a while ago, um, but acknowledging that, like, I'm still a racist. And he looked at me like, I didn't, I didn't think you were like that. I'm like, well, I mean, that doesn't just shut off. Like, years of programming, you know, I still catch myself making snap judgments about people that don't look like me and having to catch myself saying, why do you think like that? Why are you... Why, why does this person scare you or worry you or why do you feel a certain way about this person? The only thing you know about them is what they look like. And then being able to kind of unpack that and then give, give grace to somebody that um, maybe my initial instinct would have been to, 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 to turn off. We are in year 2024 and it's really shocking. We are still seeing racial and gender segregation acts in our communities and across the country. I acknowledge a lot of work has been done through the years, but unfortunately, multiple times, it seems it is not enough. And unfortunately, the same issues are transferring from generation to generation. I wrestle with how to meet people from both communities where they are. You know, not, not everyone feels the same about this topic, and one white person doesn't speak for the entire community nor does one person of color speak for the entire community. Everybody has their own experiences and perspectives, and I really um, want to make sure that I'm being helpful, not hurtful, <laughs> that I'm you know, still being an active ally without making things worse, and sometimes it's hard for me to, to engage in those conversations and, and respect where everybody's at um, with this topic. Well, I still wrestle with my white privilege. Um, I'm much more aware of it on a daily basis and how I've benefited from it. And the question for me now is, what do I do with all that information? As a white person, how have you benefited from systems of privilege and oppression within this country? Um, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a long list. You know, I, I, the top one that just um, really weighs on me is, is generational wealth. Um, you know, my parents have a very nice home and a, and a very nice community, and it's because of uh, just generations before me that have been able to, to build that wealth, and that's very much a white privilege. Um, it's the safety. You know, my kids can run around in their neighborhood, and, and I'm not worried, um, and that's also a white privilege. Um, there's a bit of the doubt. You know, if I get pulled over by a police officer, I'm not worried, and that's something that is another white privilege. Um, just my kids watching cartoons or, or movies, and there are people that mostly look like them. I mean, it just, it, it goes on and on, and it's, that's, that's what's heavy is that it's not just one thing, it's in every aspect of our community. How can you leverage your privilege to amplify the voices and experiences of people of color within your congregation and community? Yeah, I think the first step is always to listen. So, being willing to listen to people that might say something that challenges us or upsets us. Um, that's, it's always difficult, but I think that's the, that's the right first step because if we're not listening, then, then we're just inserting our own opinion. And in this case, I think it's very important that we, uh, as the, as the member of the group of the people that's done the oppressing, that we don't continue to, to do that by inserting what we think is the right thing. So we have to start by listening and, f and forming relationships, meaningful relationships. Um, but then also I think there becomes a point, and this is you know, difficult to discern, um, there becomes a point where as a member of the group that's done the, the oppressing, and it, this isn't just racial, this goes along all lines of, of trauma and oppression, we have to be willing to step in and, and show uh, the groups that have been marginalized that we're willing to you know, not just listen, but also uh, stand up, speak, show show support, uh, because I think it's important too that uh, others understand that we're we're there for them. We hear them, we see them, and we want to help yeah. when you uh, when you give us a direction that we'll we'll walk in that direction. I read an article this week that uh, said, and I quote: "Racism has been spoken of in whispers." And it continued to say that a true ally is someone who actively supports anti-racist work and is committed to this lifelong journey and bettering themselves in society. And I think that's 
that's what we do, right? I um, no longer am silent. Like I said, those those rose colored glasses are removed, and I do what I can to grow in my own self and my own understanding and awareness, and to make that a part of my community and of the world around me. Um, the biggest one that I really truly believe in is acknowledging that racism exists. And um, that's a big part of Be the Bridge. You know, there's a few steps that, that Be the Bridge talks about. Um, and acknowledgement is really three of those four steps. So listening to other people, learning from their experiences, and then lamenting, you know, sitting in that grief and that sorrow and that shame that I have benefited from racism and, and my white privilege. And I have, you know, been really naive and ignorant to that for a very long time and just acknowledging that um, is a huge a huge part of it in my opinion Um, and the second one is doing something right so one is personal acknowledging and and being in that the second one is do something so confront people that are saying things that you know are not true or not fair Um, knowing that policy matters who you vote for and what things you're involved in in the community um, investing in black businesses and black restaurants and, and things of that nature. I mean, all of those are just really important. Why do you think it's important for the church to celebrate Black History Month? I'd, I'd start that off by saying um, God told us to. Uh, you know, as I go back and reread the, the Old Testament, you can't, I mean, flip a couple pages one direction or other. Um, you can't go very long without seeing that God commands us to um, fight for justice. And what is justice? Well, justice is anytime someone's being oppressed unfairly or someone's being wronged and um, we're not fighting for that, that's injustice. So in this case, we had a group of people that were trying to worship God, wanted to have a relationship with God, and other people felt like they should be excluded from that or that we shouldn't be doing that together. And you know that's very clearly something that we should not be for as a church. And because we're the, you know, many generations beyond those, those decisions, but we're still living with the ramifications of those decisions hundreds of years later, it's our job to, to right those wrongs, whether, that, whether that's, you know, keeping bad stuff from happening or fixing the bad stuff that's already happened. Um, I, I feel like it's really important for us to, you know, work towards correcting some of these wrongs that have uh, occurred over the last few centuries. This is where I think the hope comes in, right? Everything so far has been hard, uh, really, really hard. But when you think about our faith and you think about our God, uh, he intentionally created a racially and ethnically diverse group of people. And he invites everyone to have a seat at the table. No single race or culture can really fully display God's image. Yet American history has given favor to one specific group of people. And that favor came from a place of hate and greed and power and self-serving preservation. But God is the source of hope and joy and peace. And he has called us to wash the feet of others, to humble ourselves in service, and to fight for what is good and right. And I think the church has a very important part in doing that. You know, what ways are you seeing or observing, you know, racism still actively in Charlotte? When I arrived to the United States back in 2006, I started looking for a job as a banking international accountant, which is my area of expertise. As any regular candidate, I sent my, I sent my resume to different employment agencies in Charlotte, and the responses were very promising, as all of them gave me an, an in-person interview within days. Everything looked good. But after meeting with different recruiters, I noticed they always asked me about my migration status, even though their applications had this information as a mandatory field for non-citizen applicants. The bottom line, they were curious to know what type of visa I had. I remember one of the recruiters asked me if I had a different name as Javier is a very Latino name and companies often filter out Latino candidates. After hearing this, I laughed and I told to the headhunter, you can call me John if that is going to get me a job. In my case, I do remember when we just arrived to Charlotte and going to buy a breakfast table. I went into a store, asked for the price of uh, the one I liked, 
and the salesman, an older white man said, um, it costs this much money, but I think you may want to look into these other ones. Um, he did not say cheaper or anything, but I think that's what he was trying to imply. I didn't look further. I got the one I liked, which I'm not so sure if I really liked it that much or if I got it because I also wanted to prove a point. Looking back, I really should have just kept on looking, go to another store, or even ask, why do you think I should like this ones better? What are effective methods you've seen or experienced that amplify the voices of people of color? Starting small as the Be The Bridge group is the most effective way to get a sense of what's going on in your community. What can be done and what is your audience? However, it would need to be taken at another level as it progresses. I think that social media has helped make the struggle more visible. An example of this is the unfortunate death of George Floyd, which resulted in a movement for all to acknowledge that black lives matter. Social media ha has many negative connotations, but in this case, it has helped. Why do you think it's important for the church to highlight the celebrations of your culture and the struggles your culture has been through? We know that church is a place where people attend with a common goal, such as finding God and growing spiritually, regardless of race, gender, or skin color. If the church community is aware that there are other celebrations within different cultures, the church will become more diverse and diversity enriches the communities. We are hopeful that with more information, we can try to remove the bias, conscious or unconscious, against people of color and other cultures. The more we learn about other cultures, the more open we become. We need to send the message to our brains and hearts that it is okay to be different and that it is possible that we like and even love others that are different than us. These questions serve as a starting point for self-examination and action. By understanding our own complicity and system systems of racism, we can begin to build bridges towards a more just and inclusive United Methodist Church. Building bridges starts with education and introspection. Congregations must commit to learning about these experiences and the struggle of black Americans, both past and present. It al it's also essential to engage in meaningful dialogue and create spaces for healing and reconciliation. Absolutely. It's essential for white individuals to move beyond passive awareness to active engagement in the work of racial justice. Together, we can create a church community that reflects the diversity and equality inherent in God's kingdom. These disparities not only perpetuate injustice, but also hinder our ability to fully embody the inclusive love of Christ. Now, let's zoom into our local context. In Charlotte, North Carolina, a city known for its vibrant communities, recent studies have shown alarming rates of racial disparities. According to a 2023 Black Wealth Data Center, Charlotte is 45% white, 35% black, 7% Asian, and 13% Hispanic and other ethnicities. While there is no clear majority, the black unemployment rate is 10% compared to 4% for white households. These disparities not only perpetuate injustice, but they also hinder our ability to fully embody the inclusive love of Christ. Jade and Nina both helped guide us through our first Be the Bridge class in 2022. They both have impacted my journey more than I can say. Welcome to the podcast today, and thank you so much for taking time to talk with us. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. We want to ask you both the same questions that we asked our other members of the Be The Bridge group. So first of all, why did you sign up for the Be The Bridge Grow Group? Um, well, actually, um, my my boss is a member of the church here, and um, we often have discussions race-related when there's a, a large incident or something that, you know, piques America's curiosity or gets them talking. And so... Um, along those lines, I think she knew that this was coming up and asked me if I would be interested in participating. I was strong on by Brittany. <laughs> <laughs> no, Say more um, words. <laughs> I mean, no, she had approached me about Be the Bridge, and I remembered Latasha coming to church, and I came to the workshop she had, and then she came back and did service on that Sunday, and I was a little. No, I was a lot of 
excited, but a little upset because I felt like it should have been way more people here for that, um, to experience that and just to hear what she had to say. Because it wasn't like she was pointing the finger at anybody. She was just making folks aware. Because even, even though I grew up Baptist, when I came to um, Light of Christ as a United Methodist Church, my family, we were like culture shock. So to see that, okay, they brought somebody here that is bringing awareness to something. And I will never forget her saying the most segregated place in America today is the church. I never thought about it like that. So even though I feel like um, Brittany Strong armed me into doing this, <laughs> that's what I tell everybody. But honestly, it was I was curious. I'm like, OK, what exactly could this group do? Yeah. What exactly is Be the Bridge? And I went out. I, I went ahead. And I said yes. I was nervous about it, but I said yes. So the class itself, what did you learn from that experience? Um, well, mostly I I wanted to listen um, to other members in the group before I had anything um, to say because I, I wasn't sure how it was going to flow. And, and um, <clears throat> so um, I listened to a few people, and I think in those first few meetings, like, you know, when you talk about things as serious as racism and being the bridge, you know, people kind of clam up first before they open up. And so I knew it probably would be a bit of, of that. And then I was interested in what would be said, like, after they stopped clamming up. And so um, it, it took a little while, but eventually I think that my mindset had, had always been that people who were in the majority, um, uh, people who hold power, people who are, you know, um, basically white people have privilege and, and a lot of them are not even aware of it. Um, and it's wonderful that they have it <laughs> because they aren't aware of it. And, um, and I thought, this is something everybody knows, all of these things that have taken place, all of the, um, the, issues that black people have to confront, you know, through the 50s, through the 60s, all of that. You know, I felt like it should be well known because it was televised, publicized, whatever. And so I, my thought has always been that white people knew that these things had happened and they were okay with it. Mm -hmm. And so um, it really is hard to, to get people to talk about it because then you would have to acknowledge, you know, being complicit. and. Um, and I was just really in my mind trying to figure out how that was going to go because I couldn't, I couldn't fathom people saying, <laughs> you know, after a while, like, oh, yeah, you know, that is me. I thought, you know, that's, that's one of the hardest things to do when you're talking about race for people to really, they might reflect, but they reflect privately. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so sharing with a group, I thought that, would, that might be a little difficult. I think also it was interesting, you made comment one time, like, like a lot of people didn't know, you know, or they had like pushed it out maybe. And like how surprising that was to both of you, like how much of stuff that like is just talked about in your homes, like wasn't talked about. And so the complicity, yeah, for sure. You like stuff that's on the news. You can't, you can't say you didn't see it. Right. But there were like some stories in the book in Latasha's book that people were just like dumbfounded by, that was just like part of your everyday conversation. Like, are you willing to talk about that? Like, how was that for you for people to be like, like they, they didn't know, you know? Well, I didn't, I didn't in my mind, if I'm, if I'm being completely honest and I am, cause I am. Um, <laughs> That's why I, I keep you around, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it tells <laughs> the truth, babe. <laughs> I didn't think that they, I didn't believe it that they didn't know because I, for me, it's hard to fathom. You know, if I'm, if I'm in my neighborhood and there's all black people around me, then I know I'm in a black neighborhood. And if you're a, a white and you live in an all white neighborhood, um, then you know that they're, you know, you're in an all white neighborhood. And so does the mind wonder why aren't, why are we all white? You know, are, where are the others, the others, uh, people. And so my thing is if you're choosing housing, in areas where other people look like you, and if you're choosing schools mm -hmm. where your kids go and other people look like your kids, and you um, socialize with people who look like you all the time, that to me is like an active 
choice that you should be aware of. And sure. so it, it just didn't dawn on me. I mean, black people had to be together because we had to be. You know, we were segregated, so we couldn't couldn't mix. And I don't think that if we did, we would have had a problem with it, but we didn't belong. And so my thoughts were that if this is how you're living, then this is your choice, and it's an active choice in your head that you're making. And so, yeah, complicit. <laughs> yeah, it feels, yeah, it feels right. Um, what I learned from this experience, I learned a lot about myself mostly. Um, I also learned that there is a huge difference between Baptists and Southern Baptists. I had no idea Southern Baptist was that like that mm-hmm. until this group. Mm-hmm. And I used to hear stuff about Southern Baptist, but I'm like, okay, I, I grew up Baptist, but I don't, I didn't, I never knew. I never bothered to look into it either, but Southern Baptist was not a good thing. It is not a good thing. Well, yeah, it, it definitely was, uh, you know, what you're speaking of, like this segregation that yeah. happened, right? Yeah. yeah, like it was a pretty blatant, <laughs> yeah, in yeah. the in the writing of what it is, yeah. And I was in with the first class. I was definitely in a different space, and it taught me how to not be quiet anymore. It taught me how to speak up, and I'm the type of person. I don't speak up unless it's warranted. And I was dealing with some stuff at the time, and it's like, okay, wait a minute. I have a voice. I need to start using it. Start speaking up for people that don't necessarily can say anything for themselves or they don't know how to. And when we did the class again, it's like I was way more open this time around because like you, I was like, I don't know. I don't know. I was telling everybody, oh, you're not going to offend me. I don't really have much to say. But as the class went on, I do have a lot to say. <laughs> so it, were, it really it has really helped me find my voice and be able to be okay with speaking about something that's not right. And I owe a lot of that to Brittany because it's like I see her standing up for herself, especially with you know, things that are going on around the church and stuff right now. And it's like, that's my buddy. And if I got no issues standing up for her, I got to stand up for myself too. So it's been, it's been a great experience. And I definitely enjoyed leading the class again. And I look to leading it as long as people will sign up for it. I hope everybody signs up for it because it's just a, it starts with a conversation. I've always been the type to be like, okay, let's have a conversation about this because you want to be able to understand what's going on. Clearly, you don't know. Let's talk about it. It's not pointing the finger at you. It's not saying, oh, your people did this or your people did that to my people. No, it's not that at all. Yes, there are issues. It was issues from back in the 50s and the 60s. It's 2024. We're having the same issues now. It's nothing wrong with having a conversation about it, especially if you don't understand. I would rather listen to understand than rather listening to respond because that could be tragic. And I've been telling everybody that having a conversation, there's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's okay to ask questions. It's okay to question, okay, something's not right here. What are we missing? So why not have a conversation, especially as something as serious as racism? I'm so grateful for your voice and your leadership. So both of you, what do you still wrestle with today? I don't know. I don't know that I wrestle with it as much as I think of it as just an, an inevitability, you know, that um, I, I do think that, uh, you know, initiatives, causes like these are important. And listening to what um, Nina just said, you know, having a conversation, I think really, actually, I really feel like there was a veil lifted from my eyes, to be honest with you, because um, in my life, I can say that I maybe maybe once or twice have experienced overt you know, racism, but most of the time, you know, racism is subtle. It, 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 you don't see it. So you don't know when you're operating through your life, whether you're experiencing it or not. You know, I, I pay attention to cues. You know, I look at, I watch people. I, I, I pay attention to their interaction with me. You know, it's small things on a daily basis. And so, um, 
I wrestle with all with what all black people wrestle with um, because every day, you know, I was at work one day and was explaining to them when they were just talking about inclusiveness and being yourself when you come to work, not having to leave yourself on the, you know, your problems or issues on the doorstep, just bring your full self in. And um, I don't think that black people can do that, you know, uh, and do it comfortably. What we can do is learn how to uh, operate in the world so that when we're in this space, we're this person, but then when we're away from that, we can be ourselves. And so that question, you know, what do you wrestle with? I wrestle with the fact that it's been the same for so long, it's probably gonna be the same for me, or it has been the same for me. And, you know, sadly, you know, it's probably gonna be the same for my son. I think it's a little, you know, different from them because they have so much fire and they're just like, we're not putting up with this. You know, they're like the generation in the 50s and 60s, which I wasn't even born in the 50s, uh, you know, late 60s. I was eight months old when Martin Luther King um, was killed. And so, um, my parents kept us protected and we were around people who loved us. And so I never looked to anyone else or any other group for my fortification. It came from my family and my home. Um, and so I don't know that I would have known unless it was overt exactly, you know, what the issue was. Um, and I think a lot of black families are like that because our parents and grandparents and great grandparents have been so traumatized by events that have taken place that they don't share that information. So we don't carry that history. But I also think it's very important that we know it so we can combat it when we see it again, you know. I don't know if I still wrestle with anything today from the class. Um, sometimes I do find it a little hard to speak up. I guess it just depends on the level of the situation at the time but like Jade said you know like we've been we call I call it code switching so it's like we know how to turn it on and turn it off it's just it's second nature to us we've been doing this for so long so but there is there is times where I'm thinking to myself oh man I missed the opportunity I could have said something and then I try to be intentional about making sure I don't miss an opportunity again to say something and um I have been able to do that, but I can see where I do struggle a little bit still with that. Just making sure that I don't miss an opportunity, like speak up for somebody. And it's like at, at my job, I'm on the diversity, equity, and inclusion committee in the office. I was on the corporate council for the whole company as well, but that's only for like two years. But in the office, once you're on the committee, you're on the committee. So it's like somebody is, um, Somebody's always asking, like, is this, does this fall under the dot? <laughs> and we're like, okay, well, let's unpack this. Let's talk about it. So it makes, it lets me know, hey, somebody wants to make sure that we're not excluding anybody. We want to make sure everybody feels included. My company does a really good job about that because they talk about all ethnicities, all holidays. They put out something all the time about making sure everybody recognizes, okay, for some people, they celebrate this. Here's a few people that will let us know why they celebrate it, why it's important. They do that all the time. So it's like in that aspect of it, I'm looking at it like, okay, my company is trying to make sure that they're in the know so nobody feels excluded. Everybody feels included no matter where they come from, where no matter where they identify. They just started a pride ERG group at work, like I think last year in November. And um, I haven't been able to jump on for a meeting because when they do it, I'm not on. I'd be so mad. But <laughs> but to see that they are, they've always been inclusive to everybody. So it's like it's something for everybody there, no matter what. So yeah, let's shout out your company. Who, who do oh, you work for? I work for GM Financial. There you go. All right. <laughs> <laughs> shout them out. They're doing a good job. Yeah. 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 yeah, that's really cool. Thank you all for sharing. I, I'm curious. We've kind of answered the next question, but I'm gonna, so I'm going to kind of turn it a bit. But. Um, you know, what ways are you seeing or observing, you know, racism still actively in Charlotte? Maybe it's towards you, maybe it's towards other people, but are, do you have examples of, of things you're still seeing happen in Charlotte? We talked about your parents grew up here, both said your parents grew up here, like, um, you say it, a lot hasn't changed, right? So what are we still seeing? What are some things that we should be aware of? I think that that racism most heavily lies systemically in 
in everything. I mean, in in every single thing. When you read the statistics and you see that ten percent of you know black people, you know, are this or you know, it's you hear on the news they're talking about health. This predominantly affects you know African Americans and you know high blood pressure, to be diabetes, all of these things that predominantly affect our community. And then they talk about the reasons why. And it's like almost, you hear it so much, it's just like now when you hear about, you know, shootings, people become apathetic after a while. And so it's like you hear it and you're like, oh, okay, well, yeah, we know it's because you had slavery and, you know, but move on, you know, it's, it's a new world now. It's the 21st century, we've had a black president and uh, that probably will never happen again, <laughs> I'm thinking. But um, I, I just feel like, you know, things will be the same until there is legislation and laws that, ha that have to be changed because people's hearts can change, but if you can't change the system that you have to operate in, um, then you're just basically loving one another but still in the same situation. So um, I think when you talk about education, when you talk about health care, when you talk about child care, when you talk about everything, you know, um, job hunting, I, I just finished a round of interviews. Um, I know there were a couple of companies that have, uh, more than a couple that have been laying off. 95 or maybe 99% of my applicants are all African American. As a matter of fact, I, I think there was, I had one white man and he had, you know, has been working for a while. So, and he was in the mortgage industry as well, like most of these people were. But that tells me something, you know. Well, I know that we have a company that's worth, you know, working for. But when I interviewing, you know, African American after African American after, Af and there's a layoff, I'm thinking, okay, well, how many people do you have working for you, or did you just lay off a whole, you know, slew of? African Americans. So those things make you think. You don't say anything necessarily about it because it's old hat. You're used to it. You know, last hired, first fired, but that's true, especially if you're black. And even though people will say, well, oh, that's changed, it's not, it's not. It's just subtle. You know, it's that subtle kind of thing. And um, and so it's frustrating. And I think that's the thing that I have been wrestling with because I, I didn't have that kind of, those necessarily those thoughts or that mindset until like that veil came off and I really started looking at things and um so it's 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 a little difficult to live with every every single day you know uh, especially when you have a child and you're sending him into a world that basically hasn't changed since mm -hmm. you came into existence yeah. so what can you provide for them that gives them that you know children have confidence they'll go off and do whatever it is they can do but when you're having to say, no, 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 can't do that. No, don't go there. Or if you go there, don't wear this, you know. Or, you know, call me when you get here. I'll come there and pick you up. Uh, or, you know, or he, is he's going out with his friends and there's four in a car. Wait a minute. Let me, let me look at the license plate. Let me make sure you have your everything. I don't want any reason for them to have any interaction uh, with the law or with me, you know, and I don't want to worry him either. So I just hold it in silence. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of mothers a lot of, in a yes. lot of black families um, that do that. There's mothers in all families that do that, but particularly us because, you know, we all know what happens, so. Mm. Thanks for sharing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For me, um, I wrestled with the fact that everything is changing here in this city, and for a minute I couldn't find housing because it was like everything skyrocketed. And it really bothered me. I was finally able to find something last summer that I could actually afford. And I honestly thought I didn't, but I wasn't going to get it because I was thinking income restricted is the same thing as income based. I learned a difference. It doesn't necessarily mean income restricted doesn't mean income based, but it's like you can work and you can make money, but you can't go over a certain amount. So, but I guess I don't hit that threshold. So I was able to get the apartment and I'm just like, wow. So it's, but it's everybody in, in my apartment community is of color. I don't think I've seen anybody white, which doesn't bother me, but, um, cause I, I grew up around diversity. My mom made sure that 
we had the same opportunities or she did whatever she had to do to make sure that we could have the same opportunities for me and my brothers. And I went to a middle school and a high school that was so freaking diverse that we never had any issues. Other states were sending representatives to come look at our school to see how we were able to have all of these different ethnicities in our school and no fights broke out. There were no war. There were no like, of course, like teenage, there's a bunch of teenagers fights happen, but not black people against white people or African people against um, Korean people. It was never any of that. So I grew up looking at different people every day and we all got along great. Like we still get along to this day. We still keep in contact with each other. And I've been out of high school almost 30 years, I think. You didn't have to share that, but I appreciate it. <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying, you know, for us, it was like, I know I'm, I know I'm getting up there. My kids are probably, they call me ancient anyway. But, <laughs> but it's like to be in that environment, I tried to make sure that my kids were exposed to that too. Because it's like, it's different people out here in the world. Don't necessarily go off of anything that you hear from somebody else. Find out for yourself. And one of the kids, one of my, well, there are many adults now, but one of them, she always says, according to my research, I'm like, oh, God, what you research today? But she always, she's letting me know, hey, mom, I looked into this or I read about that. Or like, have you seen this? What do you think about that? And it's like reading is fundamental. Reading is something that we were not allowed to do. Reading was something like if I guess they figured back then if this person knew how to if a black person knew how to read, that's a problem. But everybody else knew how to read. What was wrong with people learning how to read back then? And to hear now that some kids still struggle learning how to read. And they're in elementary school. That breaks my heart. It's like this kid deserves to learn how to read. This kid should be able to have just about any and everything afforded to them, just like a non-black person or non-person of color should. So why not allow them to have that opportunity? But I know, like you said, housing is a big thing, especially in the black community. Um, that table game we did, I'm, I, I will not let that experience go. I'm sorry. That, that bothered me you know, so much. It's interesting that you say that when you talk about housing and that you found a place to you know, that you could be in that was income restricted. Yeah. Because that's that's one of the systemic things that I'm talking about mm -hmm. because on its face it looks good, right? Because you have found a place and it's a place you can afford. However, <laughs> you aren't really able to do any better for yourself than what you what will provide you a, a roof over your head right. for you and your kids. Yeah. So What's built into that? You know, it's wonderful we're providing you this home, but if you go and, say, get a college degree and then get fancy pants and go out and get a job where you're over this limit, then you're homeless again, mm -hmm. right? And you're still probably not going to be making enough to afford to live in the places that you were trying to get into to begin with. Yeah, and that's, that's Those been are my the issue. kinds of things, yeah. That's been my issue, and I'm an empty nester now. Everybody's mm -hmm. gone, so it's like, and I'm noticing... Okay, yeah, I'm by myself, but things aren't really adding up for me. Mm -hmm. So now I'm just, I'm really at a crossroads, like, what? And I think it's interesting, like, when you were going through that, like, I have never worried about that. Never once. I mean, I'm just being honest. Yeah. And, like, uh, when you were, when we were talking about that, I was like, what in the world? Like, why is that? And we were going through Be the Bridge when you were looking uh, for housing. And, and I, I was like, this is wild. Like, Taylor and I would go home and just be like, what is this? Like, this is drastic injustice. Yeah. Um, because it's not like my credit score is rocking. And it's not like I make a ton of money. But I just think that, like, I've never worried about it. It's never crossed my mind to worry about. And and I, it, you, I mean, like, I, I've said it, but uh, learning so much and, like, how – what you just shared, like these systematic things that are like built to keep people down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like it's this, I think it's in the book, right? It, it says uh, the system's working exactly the way it was designed to. It's not yep. broken. It's right? not broken. Right. Uh, and so, yeah, like 
so the you know the question that I think we have to ask is like so how do we what do we do? <laughs> you know, I mean, you talked about voting. We talked about laws need to be changed because it's not enough. It's not enough. Just it is important. The conversation is very important. Yeah, but we can't stop there. Mm-mm. So there's got to be a next step, and then there's got to be another next step, and there's got to be another next step. I think I think that's the thing with with reconciliation is like it doesn't happen once. It happens forever. Yeah. Right. And that, I think, is so hard for a lot of people because they get tired, right? Like, speaking as a white person, right? Like, it's like, oh, gosh, but, like, we, you know, I feel like we've been doing this. I feel like we've been talking about it. And it's like, (laughs) come on. Like, you all been talking about it your whole existence, you know? And I started talking about it two years ago. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just so uh, counter productive, (laughs) right, For, Mm -hmm. for the idea that it could, like, we could finish something. We we haven't even started anything, yeah. right? Yeah, and I think that's really hard. So, uh, last question: Why do you think it's important for the church to highlight and celebrate Black History Month? Uh, Martin Luther King, Dr. Martin Luther King. Why do we? Why should the church be paying attention to things like that? Um, and and how do you think we can build bridges, you know, of healing through acknowledging celebrations? queen of be the bridge of course i'm gonna say something about juneteenth and of course i'm gonna say you know this is a great way to have a conversation towards building a bridge because some people may not know no this is not a made-up holiday yes it did take two years for slavery to be abolished after it was originally done i think i read somewhere the other day that one of the original presidents of this country had did all of that but of course he wasn't recognized for it so I when I did the video for Juneteenth, the response I got was amazing. I had youth and adults coming to me. I had no idea. I learned so much from your video. It wasn't long enough. And I'm like, why don't you sign up and be the bridge? We can talk about it more there. You know? Good segue. Uh, right. So I, I didn't know what kind of response I was going to get, but it I was I felt really great that I did go ahead and do the video and everybody that approached me that day, they were just like, Oh my God, I'm so happy you did that. I didn't know I learned so much. And then I had a parent. um, She also volunteers with the youth on Wednesday nights here at church. She came to me and she was like, I binge listened to all the podcasts. And um, I have to say out of all of them, yours is the most, is the favorite. I, I just really love it. And what is Be the Bridge about? What is this? What is that? I'm like, oh, okay. Let's have a conversation. Matter of fact, I don't know if we're doing anything in the spring, but I do know this is a fall class. If you want to sign up for the class in the fall, please do it. And she was like, well, I want to go ahead and get the book. Oh, feel free to get the book. I don't know where you can get it from, but if you want to talk to Brittany about getting the book, get the book. I mean, she was gung-ho. She was in it to win it. And I'm like, yes. And I had no idea that she went back and listened to All of these podcasts. I think I was the first one with um, one of the founding members of the church. and It was called Looking Back. And the dream of this church is to be a multicultural, multigenerational church. Yeah. And it's happening. That's right. It is happening like right now. And this church is like growing every week. It's more and more people. And nobody looks like anybody. That's right. Mm -hmm. Nobody speaks the same language as somebody else. And it is exciting. And the fact that we had a fifth Sunday potluck where everybody could bring their original dishes from their homeland. Oh my God. I hurt myself that Sunday. Yeah, it was so good. <laughs> it was, the so, food good. was yeah. so good. It was amazing. And I'm like, man, this is happening. We are building bridges, whether these people realize it or not, we're building bridges with each other and they're going back telling their people and they're coming to church, visiting us and they're seeing us and they're seeing how we, y'all already come through light of Christ And it's like they're expecting you. I say that all the time because that's how my family felt when we first came here. That energy has not changed. And to know that I'm a part of a church that wants to know 
hey, what is it like to walk through your shoes? What's your story? Let's sit down and have a conversation about it. And it's intentional. It's genuine. And it's not any underlying agendas or anything. Mm -hmm. Like, we really want to know about you. Yeah. Is there something we could do to help? I'm not used to people asking me, how can we help you? I've never been used to that. Still not. But I'm learning to allow my church to help me out. I'm learning that it's okay to come to my church for help if I need it. I am learning that. It is hard because I am not somebody that is big on offering, for somebody offering to help me. It's the other way around. And so being a part of Be The Bridge and lead, co-leading the group with Brittany, it's been a very big inspiration to me because it's like at the end of the day, I'm finding out I'm impacting people and I'm just being me. I'm not doing anything special. I'm just offering like another insight on something that they may not even know. And out of this class, the second class that we did, uh, one of the people that took the class, she's about to start her own. Yes. Be the bridge. Come on now. Good. She just texted me a couple of days ago. I have a date. Excellent. And I sent her all the little gifts with the dancing girls. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I, I just told her, I was like, if you need anything, do not hesitate. Me and Brittany will be more than happy to talk to you about whatever. It doesn't matter. I said, but just let the people know this is a safe space where you can come and talk. This is a place where if you have a question, please ask it. There's no nothing wrong with you asking a question because if you don't know, you don't know. But you're showing being here, you want to understand what the problem is. Is there something you can do about it? How do we bring awareness to this and go from there? Because, yes, it starts with a conversation, but you got to keep it going. Mm -hmm. Right. What do you think, Jade? Why, why is it important for us to talk about this as a church? Um. Well, I think uh, it's important because people need to see, um, well, we're not three-fifths of a person. We're not chattel. We're not property. Um, we're not inferior. Um, even though a lot of our culture um, maybe was brought, we're the only group of people that I'm aware of that don't know their last names, that were given last names of their slave owners. And so we can only go so far. You know, when we have these events, even like at work, and say, bring something from your native land, that's Charlotte for me. <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, what my people may have had, I have no idea, you know. And so um, I think it, other cultures can celebrate their history, you know, Asian cultures and, you know, Germans, Irish, whatever. They were able to keep their names. I think we're the only group that was not. And you think of all the other things that were done to the Japanese by the United States and then Native Americans and all of that. Um, and we're still looked at as, you know, kind of the bottom of that totem pole. And that also is by design. So I have to wonder on the other side of that, why, why is it so important to keep us from our history? Yeah. Why is it so important to pull books by African-American authors and history books out of the schools? What is it that you don't want us to know? And um, I, you know, I, I, that goes through my mind all the time. I think you know, we have to be more powerful than we think we are because look at all the effort and determination that has gone into us not knowing who we are and where we come from. That's so good. so um, I feel like, yeah, celebrate us all over the place. <laughs> yeah, not just in February, man. Not just in February, yeah. you, you know, <laughs> the, the shortest month of the year, but I think all kids should know, like, what happened. It, I, I don't see that same kind of energy when you're talking about um, – the Holocaust, you know, that's something that sh everybody should know about that. That's a horrible time in our history. And even horrible before that <laughs> was slavery. It was 1619. It was us being brought over. Why can't people know about that, you know? Um, so even, even in that regard, you know, they've kind of put the kibosh on it. So I'm just trying my best <laughs> to day by day educate my son the best way I can about his own because the kids live in the moment. They live in the now. We don't have to deal with that kind of stuff, but they don't realize they're dealing with it every single day. 
Um, so I think that churches should celebrate. They should acknowledge all people in their congregations. They should, you know, talk about different cultures and celebrate it, share, so that they can have experiences like what people are having, like with you know, that Nina was talking about. I know I don't sound very optimistic. <laughs> I might be going through a phase. <laughs> you sound realistic. Yeah. yeah I think that exactly. that is important, right? Like there's so often we want to like sugarcoat this mm -hmm. and there's nothing to sugarcoat. Mm -hmm. It's, it's awful. Yes. Mm -hmm. What's going on is awful. Mm -hmm. And, and until we call it evil, nothing's going to change. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Until I, we say this is evil. What's being done is evil. It's not going to change because then we can like pacify it. Mm -hmm. Well, it's always been that way. Well, you know, but that's not the truth. The truth is that, that what is happening all over the place, but especially in relate as it relates to this conversation, there's nothing right about it, mm -hmm. and and I think that we have to be very clear, right? Right. And until we are, um, and I think Nina, you said something earlier about how <laughs> you said yes to this because of me, and I I in the conversations we've been having here about reconciling ministry, I've talk to my therapist a lot about why am I the one having to lead conversations about LGBTQ <laughs> stuff that feels so ridiculous. And then it like, it's like been a brick wall. Like, well, you asked Nina to talk about, you know, mm -hmm. to be the representative <laughs> for black people. Like, right, come on, right. girl, you got to get over yourself. <laughs> you know, so it's, you know, I think as much as you gave me, you know, flowers or props there, like the same is like, I've had the same mov movement because of what you've done through Be The Bridge is, if you're going to stand and allow people to ask questions that feel uncomfortable or feel uh, hard, that I can do the same, right? And Jade, you as well, like for you to step into the Carolina Cross Connection board as the first black woman, which is like, yay, and what? Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> like there's like there's so much like, come <laughs> on. Uh, but like, like, I think we can acknowledge that out loud, you know, like for you to take that boldness and do that and, and, and speak such power and truth all the time. I think there's so much admiration that I know Marianne and I both share for you and, and the work that you're doing because it's hard work. Yes. It's yeah. hard work. And it's work that, as you've shared, feels like nothing's getting started even. Mm. Yeah. But you have changed me. And so I want to be clear about that. Well, thank yeah. you. Yeah, both of you. Thank you. Well, and there really can't be healing of any kind without honesty and vulnerability. I think that's where the healing begins. So for you to speak the truth is a gift to us and to our congregation and others who listen to this podcast. So thank you for that. And I, and I just I keep reflecting as I'm listening to you about uh, our bishop, Ken Carter, and what he says about anti-racism. He says that today, anti-racism is an essential part of our Christian discipleship. And I think he's exactly on target. Um, so thank you for being a part of discipling us and helping us to grow as disciples of Jesus. So as we come to the end of this special episode, reflecting on Black History Month and our collective journey towards reconciliation, it's essential to remember that the work doesn't end here. Black History Month serves as a poignant reminder of the struggles, triumphs, and contributions of black individuals throughout history, but it's not just a month-long celebration. It's a call to action. In our city and within the walls of our churches, there are still barriers to break down, conversations to be had, and healing to pursue. But as we've heard from our guests today and throughout this podcast series, there's hope in the power of dialogue, understanding, and solidarity. Let's commit ourselves, friends, to continue the work of reconciliation, both individually and collectively. Let's actively seek out opportunities to listen, learn, and amplify the voices of marginalized communities. Let's confront systemic injustices and work toward creating inclusive spaces where everyone feels valued and heard. As we navigate this journey, let's also remember the importance of grace and empathy. Change takes time, and we may stumble along the way, but it's through our collective efforts and willingness to engage in uncomfortable conversations that true progress is made. So as Black History Month comes to a close, Let's carry its spirit of resilience, courage, and determination with us every day. Let's be agents of change in our communities, 
advocating for justice, equality, and reconciliation. Thank you for joining us on this journey. Together, let's continue to strive for a future where every voice is heard, every life is valued, and every heart is united in love and understanding. Until next time, let's keep the conversation going. We hope you'll join us for our next episode of Affirming Methodism, which is always released monthly on the last Wednesday of the month. In March, we'll be talking to Rabbi Michael Wolk of Temple Israel here in Charlotte uh, and talking about how we can confront anti-Semitism in Charlotte uh, and around the world. Um, you can find us on Spotify, Google Podcast, Apple Podcast, and YouTube by searching for Affirming Methodism Pod. Our next episode will be released on March 27th. Go ahead and hit subscribe so you won't miss new content as it's released. As always, we encourage you to love God, love your neighbor, and affirm and celebrate the beauty in you. Thank you.